good afternoon or good evening, everybody. You're all very welcome indeed to Maynooth University, to the Centre for European and Eurasian Studies. I'm John O'Brennan, the director of the centre, and it is a pleasure to welcome our guest speaker this evening, Dr. Yasmin Mujanovic. Before I introduce Yasmin formally in a few moments, I just want to say a word about the format. Jasmine has kindly agreed to speak for about 30 minutes. He's just come back from Bosnia, Brussels and London. So um, he is absolutely au fait with thinking uh, in Bosnia and in other capitals. Um, the uh, 30 minute session will then be followed by a questions and answer segment where Jasmine will field questions from our participants. So if anybody does have a question, you are more than welcome to put it into the Q&A. Um, as you listen to Jasmine and as he goes through, uh, you'll be able to do that. And then I'll field those questions to Jasmine um, as we go along. His talk today comes a week after we had a really, really interesting event with Dr. Yelena Yurinovic from the University of Vienna. Jelena spoke last week about the politics of memory in contemporary Serbia and how memory of the Second World War in particular is used to particular ends. I'd like to also on behalf of the Centre extend a warm welcome to our friends from the Bosnia Ireland Association. Uh, we've engaged with that association uh, quite a bit in the past. We held a very memorable conference on the anniversary of the Dayton Agreement uh, on the uh, 25th um, or the 20th search um, anniversary. And we plan to hold another conference, a comparative one, which examines what has happened in Bosnia since Dayton with what has happened in Northern Ireland since the Good Friday Agreement was signed in 1998. Um, but to our speaker today. Jasmine Mujanovic it was born in Bosnia, got his PhD from York University in Canada. He specializes in the politics of authoritarian and post-authoritarian states. He is well known as the co-host of Sarajevo Calling, a leading podcast on Southeast European affairs. He uh, published his first book in 2018 that was called Hunger and Fury, The Crisis of Democracy in the Balkans, published by Hearst and OUP, which examines the persistence of authoritarian forms and forms of illiberal governance in the Western Balkans since the end of the Yugoslav Wars. He's also published widely in academic journals uh, completed work for leading think tanks such as the Frederick Ebert Stiftung, the European Council on Foreign Relations, and Freedom House, and is also a very frequent contributor to Balkan Insight, to the New York Times, Open Democracy, and many other such outlets. It's a pleasure, uh, Yasmin, to welcome you to Ireland, figuratively, metaphorically, and in every other way possible. And I'll um, give you the floor now to speak to us about understanding the crisis in contemporary Boston. Well, thank you very much, John, and it's it's a tremendous honor to be here. Um, I, I do wish I was in Ireland, actually, but here we are. Um, I will just also acknowledge that I do have a little bit of a co-speaker with me in my lap, uh, so hopefully she will be cooperative, uh, but uh, she's doing well so far. So, um, like I said, uh, very, very glad to be here. Um, I'm going to give you kind of the rundown of what I feel like you need to know about what's going on in Bosnia-Herzegovina right now. Um, that does involve a certain kind of historical perspective, but I think it's also important that we really situate this in, in a kind of contemporary moment, okay? Um, I, I, I think the most obvious thing to, to begin uh, with is obviously to acknowledge that this contemporary secession crisis and government obstruction crisis, and, and, and they're kind of two very closely related phenomena, but nevertheless distinct. So on the one hand, we have the secession crisis, which is being led by um, the, the Serb nationalist uh, establishment in the RS entity, in particular by Mr. Dodik and his party, the SNSD. And then we have this now nearly three and a half, four year long 
crisis of government formation and the other entity, um, the larger and more prosperous of the two entities, the Federation entity, um, and that government obstruction uh, uh, blockade, as it were, has been initiated and held up by the HDZ party, which is the main Croat nationalist party in the country, and also happens to be uh, the closest coalition partner of the of the SNSD. Right, so they actually work very closely in tandem, um, politically and otherwise, and so that is very important to understanding this this moment because there's two dimensions to it. Okay, but I'll I'll come back to that in a second. So the the kind of the bigger um, the bigger and broader thing to be understood about all of this, of course, is Dayton itself, right? Um, Dayton, as as one should always acknowledge, is arguably the most successful peace agreement in modern history. Um, even arguably more so than the Good Friday Agreement, um, if only for the sheer scale of the violence that accompanied the Bosnian War and the Bosnian Genocide, right? Uh, I always like to remind folks that when we're talking about the whole of the Yugoslav Wars, we're talking about somewhere between 140 and 150,000 people killed. Um, of those, fully 100,000 people are killed just in Bosnia-Herzegovina alone. And of the entirety of the death toll of all of the Yugoslav Wars put together, uh, just under 50% of all deaths including combatants and civilians, comes exclusively from one community, and that is the Bosnian community, who were also the primary targets of the Bosnian genocide, right? So there's an incredible disparity of violence that accompanied the Bosnian war that in some ways makes the fact that once Dayton is initiated, that there's a kind of full stop end to the violence, all that all that more remarkable, right? And, and that should be recognized and, and, and acknowledged and, and dare one even say celebrated, right? On the flip side, of course, is the very unique feature of the Dayton Accords, which is that the Bosnian constitution is embedded within it. Annex four of the constitution, um, it is, as far as I know, the only constitution in the world, which is a subset of a broader uh, diplomatic uh, document, as it were. And of course, the Dayton Constitution, Annex 4, also happens to be arguably the most complicated constitutional regime in the world, especially for a country that is as small as Bosnia is, right? Territorially or geographically, we would say, you know, my usual example is kind of the American one, which is to say it's about the size of the state of West Virginia. Um, you know, perhaps for a more local example, it's about the size of Wales, give or take, right? It's not a big place. Uh, today, the population of Bosnia is somewhere around 3 million. Um, I, I don't even think that the last census figures yeah. from 2013 are necessarily that accurate because um, emigration is such a profound and significant phenomenon in the country. So we're realistically talking about a country of approximately 3 million people, right? Um, and so for 3 million people, you have 14 different governments, 14 different levels of government. Um, you have a tripartite presidency. Uh, you have a bicameral state legislature, but that's yeah. in addition to um, uh, essentially 12 or 13, depending on how you want to count other legislatures that are uh, uh, divided across the country. Uh, you also have the office of the high representative. So you have this extremely, extremely complex political structure, as you may know. And then, of course, uh, uh, colored all across all of that is, of course, the fact that virtually every significant public office in the country is allocated and divided strictly along ethno-sectarian lines. And within the system, you also have these robust ethnic vetoes, um, which allow, in particular, our national party, nationalist parties to obstruct any kind of rational governance, which is to say, actually, that is one of the very important aspects of this entire story, that um, Bosnia's post-war political regime has been characterized by uh, arguably the most robust and decentralized form of ethnic power sharing in the world, but it turns out ethnic power sharing does not actually result in very much rational governance. And that is one of the great kind of ironies or perhaps great difficulties uh, of the contemporary Bosnian state. We have a tremendous degree of power sharing and very little in the way of governance. So that then brings us, of course, to um, the current secession crisis. Um, and we, we have to, again, sort of place contemporary demands, which we're hearing from Banja Luka and the Dodik regime, into, into a historical context. So by their own admission, or by their own argumentation, as it were, the reasons for the current secession crisis 
according to Dudek and his um, party, come specifically from essentially this summer. Um, and what happened over the course of this summer was that the outgoing high representative, um, Valentin Insko, an Austrian diplomat, imposed a so-called anti-genocide denial law on Bosnia Herzegovina, outlawing the denial of not just Bosnian genocide um, denial, not just outlawing Bosnian genocide denial, but also Holocaust denial, and also the denial of any other kinds of war crimes or crimes against humanity that took place um, during the Yugoslav wars, or indeed have been internationally recognized as such. Okay, so that supposedly is why the government in the RS entity presently is attempting to um, effectively uh, engage in a process of secession in all but name, um, because they argue that <clears throat> this is a, a, a untoward imposition on the democratic rights uh, and political rights of, um, as they put it, quote unquote, ethnic Serbs in the RS. And of course, I put quote unquote ethnic Serbs, because it's important to, to distinguish between the nationalist rhetoric and demands of one particular party, in this case, the SNSD, and an entire community as such, which is to say the Bosnian Serb community, right? Uh, we, we, should, we should be careful not to tar the entire community with the particular ideological proclivities of Mr. Dodik and his cohort. Now, of course, that argument that this is all coming from uh, the imposition of a anti-genocide denial law is, of course, not true. And it's not true for two reasons. One, uh, the SNSD has very explicitly been engaging in um, pro-secession activities and rhetoric for um, virtually most of the last decade. Uh, a number of years ago, they actually formally voted uh, as a party at their party Congress uh, to sort of initiate or rather to set up as their kind of ultimate objective, the secession of the RS entity um, from Bosnia-Herzegovina. It's also very clear that this cohort, this host of laws, these omnibus laws that the RS authorities are in the process of now passing at the um, RS entity level, it's very clear that all of those laws were actually prepared uh, very far in advance uh, of Mr. Insko's um, uh, imposition of his anti-genocide denial law, right? So that's been, uh, that's been in the works for much longer than this summer. And then, of course, there is a very practical and uh, which may sound somewhat legalistic, um, but I think very, very important aspect in all of this. Um, Mr. Dudik's argument comes down to this idea that it is inappropriate for the high representative to use his or her bond powers to impose any number of um, uh, decisions, both in the context of the anti-genocide law, but he's also kind of writing off the notion of the bond powers as a whole. Um, and he's also calling for the bond powers, uh, or pardon me, for the OHR to be dismissed and dismantled in its entirety and to leave Bosnia. But he's also then expanded that argument to include a whole host of, um, as he puts it, authorities that have been quote unquote stripped from the RS um, and, and uploaded, as it were, to the Bosnian state, right? So, so things that he believes are actually the legal and constitutional purview of the entities have actually been handed over to the state. So there's, there's kind of two important things to, to untangle there. The first is that all of these things that have supposedly been uploaded to the Bosnian state, virtually all of them have actually happened through acts of the Bosnian parliament. And in most cases, they were things that his own party actually supported, that they voted for in previous years. Secondly, because they're acts of the state parliament, there's also a very straightforward way to rolling back those laws, right? Uh, you would again go through the state parliament. You would initiate a normal legal constitutional process whereby a certain law that is no longer popular for whatever reason yeah. among certain actors, you again, initiate a standard parliamentary procedure and you pass a new law that is more to your liking. And the question that becomes, why is Mr. Dudik not doing this? Um, and the reason for that is because he doesn't want to do it. And part of that is one, he knows he doesn't have the support to do it, um, which uh, you would think is a standard democratic event that a certain party wants to do something, but it doesn't have enough democratic support in the parliament or in the legislature. But of course, to Mr. Dudik, that is unacceptable. And two, 
The real reason ultimately is that actually the whole point of this production is to engage in the process of secession without having to say that you're engaging in secession. Because there is no polity on earth in which a subnational legislative assembly can overturn unilaterally the acts of a state parliament, which is what they're doing, right? It's, it's like saying that, hey, the state of California doesn't like a law that was passed by the US Congress. So the state of California is gonna pass its own law saying that it's quote unquote withdrawing out of the federal framework of whatever the Congress passed. That of course can't happen. Right, that is that is a one through one violation of any kind of constitutional setup, even a federal constitutional setup. And Bosnia is not actually a kind of straightforward classic federal regime, even though it's often compared to one. Right, and then of course we go back to the OHR. Right, and we say, okay, we don't like the bond powers. We think this is undemocratic, so on and so forth. Even if one grants that argument, and I think um, there's you know there's there's a lot to be said on that topic, why the OHR exists. Um, the legitimacy of the OHR, uh, the o legitimacy of the bond powers, and I generally take a broadly positive view of them. But even if one is willing to grant that there is some kind of political trouble with the existence of something like the OHR, it is also the case that the OHR, with the agreement of all then relevant political actors in Bosnia Herzegovina, including the SNSD, set up the so-called five plus two formula. And the five plus two formula was the formula that was set up for the closure of the OHR, right? It set up a very, very clear criterion for how the OHR would be closed. And it's not actually a particularly onerous set of demands. Uh, a handful of them concern essentially the establishment of a broadly functional rule of law regime. And the other major ask concerns the question of state property. Right. Uh, in particular, a handful of military installations, which the Bosnian Constitutional Court has ruled are rightly in the possession of the Bosnian state um, and therewith also the Bosnian Armed Forces. So as soon as uh, the appropriate laws and legislation is passed to normalize uh, the possession of those uh, uh, objects in the possession of the Bosnian state, the OHR can pretty much go ahead and close, um, which is to say if Mr. Dodik wanted to do what he wanted to do, or rather what he claims he wants to do, which is to say to see the departure of the OHR, he could, of course, simply agree to these very straightforward demands, i.e., in particular, the handover of these properties which are located on the territory of the RS to the Bosnian state. Mr. Dodik does not want to do that. He doesn't want to do that because the ultimate kind of offshoot or rather the ultimate cause of all of this of course is an ideological one and this is the part that's really really hard i think for certain international actors to wrap their minds around mr dodik has an ideological commitment to the idea of secession he has an ideological and political commitment to the idea of realizing uh, completing the project that was initiated by, by people like uh, Radovan Karadzic and Radko Mladic, he is ideolo ideologically committed to the idea of the dissolution of the Bosnian state. And so all of virtually all of the kind of rhetoric that we hear from Mr. Dodek, these kind of legalistic arguments, are almost to a certain extent purposefully and intentionally shallow and hollow and do not bear any kind of sustain any kind of real political or intellectual scrutiny because they are on the face of it absurd. What he wants, he knows, doesn't actually comport to any kind of international law. It doesn't actually comport to anything that is legally or politically possible within the Dayton Accords. He wants it because he wants it because he's an ideologue and a hardline nationalist. And so he doesn't like Bosnia and he doesn't want to be in Bosnia. And so he wants to separate the RS entity from that. Now there is a kind of, uh, shall we say, personal political and economic reason for that separation, right? Mr. Dudek is also at heart an authoritarian and he would like to use the separation and secession of the RS entity uh, for, for realizing one of his other kind of ultimate aims, which is just to rule permanently as an entrenched autocrat. A lot of that he's actually already done. I mean, he's already essentially turned the RS entity into his private fiefdom, um, but 
there is still theoretically the possibility of him and his party losing power. And that is largely shored up by the fact that the RS entity still has to comport or exist within the broader electoral framework of the Bosnian state, which ensures a certain kind of degree of relative democratic accountability. And just to show that this is actually a plausible scenario, I remind you of the last local elections that happened in Bosnia last year, which saw the SNSD uh, party suffer really historic losses, above all in the uh, in the uh, de facto capital uh, of the entity, which is uh, Banja Luka. They lost the mayoralty of, of Banja Luka, the, the largest urban center um, in, in the RS entity. Incidentally, I also say de facto capital because the de, de jure capital of the RS entity, which is often forgotten, is actually Sarajevo. Um, that's according to their own constitution, but uh, that's another thing that's sort of been lost to the sands of time. Um, so the idea of losing power and democratic accountability is something that does genuinely worry Mr. Dodik. I would also remind you of events like the so-called Justice for David protests um, that roiled the RS entity um, for, for the better part of the last two or three years um, and very much spoke to the kind of deeply criminalized nature of the regime there. And unsurprisingly, the regime also used um, police violence to break up those protests, okay? So the, the, the kind of the drive for secession is animated both by Mr. Dodik's ideological um, opposition, shall we say, to the existence of the Bosnian state. Um, and it's also driven by a certain kind of self-interest um, and, and you know, criminal self-dealing, as it were. Um, that kind of finally brings us to the last major point that I want to make. And that concerns the role of the Croat nationalist uh, party, the HDZ. Um, the HDZ has a long time close relationship with the SNSD. Um, part of that, again, is rooted to their own ideological commitments. They're not necessarily tutto completo opposed to the existence of the Bosnian state, but they certainly are tutto completo opposed to the idea of anything that might broadly resemble a kind of liberal democratic framework. Uh, because again, this is a party that wins 9% of the vote approximately at the national level. And as a result of the current constitutional arrangements, that translates to somewhere between 30 to 40% of ministerial seats um, at the state and uh, federation entity level, right? And so this is a party that is hugely overrepresented. Um, and of course, like any rational actor, it is a party that is unwilling to give up uh, the power that it enjoys uh, under current constitutional arrangements. Um, the kind of specific longtime objective of the HDZ party has been essentially to uh, assure for itself the kind of permanent political control um, that the SNSD has thanks to the RS entity, which is to say they want essentially their own entity, right? They want they, they want what's often kind of times called the so-called third entity or something vaguely approximating to it. Uh, in recent um, electoral negotiations, electoral reform negotiations in Bosnia Herzegovina, this has been phrased as a so-called virtual entity, right? So an entity that would not necessarily exist in a territorial sense, but would uh, virtually appear during elections, um, where you would essentially have a severely ethically segregated electoral system that would it, that would ensure that the HDZ um, would essentially never have to compete in an open political system. That that is that is kind of the the, the short and sweet of it, um, and so. As this whole secession crisis has been going on, what's been really striking is that there's been a very, very significant degree of international involvement uh, in Bosnia and Herzegovina at the same time, but very explicitly not dealing with the secession crisis, but very specifically dealing with the issue of electoral reform, exclusively with the issue of electoral reform in Bosnia and Herzegovina. And there, again, it gets still more complicated because EU and US mediators um, in dealing with the issue of electoral reform in Bosnia and Herzegovina, which of course it has to undergo because of uh, approximately half a dozen cases that the Bosnian state has lost uh, at the European Court of Human Rights and also uh, owing to decisions by Bosnia's own constitutional court, which have found that large segments of the Dayton constitution are patently discriminatory. Um, all of this of course has to be changed, it has to be amended. Um, but when you actually look at the substance of what uh, people like Mr. Matthew Palmer, who's the U.S. elections envoy, or Ms. Angelina Eichhorst, who is the EU's um, 
uh, uh, envoy uh, at the moment who's kind of been leading European efforts at electoral reform, they don't appear to be particularly interested in addressing any of the major electoral reform cases that have come down against the Bosnian state, with the exception of one particular case, which has actually technically already been resolved, but this kind of broader issue that the HDZ party has um, with Bosnia's current electoral system, which is that they essentially argue that it allows too many opportunities for non-nationalist actors to, um, to make any kind of headway. And, and specifically, their argument comes down to the case of um, Mr. Komšić, who is the current Croat member of the tripartite state presidency. Um, Mr. Komšić is a self-identifying Croat, um, but he is not a member of the HDZ party. And he also does genuinely enjoy a very significant degree of support from ethnic Bosniaks and Bosnians more broadly, as well as uh, 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 ethnic Croats who happen to not support the HDZ, right? So he's kind of this, uh, broadly speaking, non-nationalist candidate. This is a huge issue for the HDZ. It's a huge issue that um, someone who comes from a community that represents um, 12 or 13 percent of the overall population, that's about how many Bosnian Croats there are, He's someone who doesn't identify as a nationalist and is doubtlessly the single most popular politician in um, Bosnia Herzegovina. So, for a nationalist sectarian party like the HDZ, this is a major, major issue because, like the SNSD, they want to portray a zero sum version of Bosnian politics and Bosnian society. Um, they want a deeply segregated society, not only where only quote unquote Croats can vote for other Croats, when you actually go to the substance, the real nitty gritty of what they're asking for, they only want Croats in a very specific part of Bosnia Herzegovina to actually be able to elect um, the most important as they see it, uh, uh, political posts in Bosnia Herzegovina, in particular the presidency. And what they very specifically want are uh, Bosnian Croats from Western Herzegovina. And the reason why they want the Croats exclusively from Western Herzegovina is because those tend to be the most kind of conservative and right-wing voters among the uh, ethnic Croat electorate. So they're less interested or not at all concerned actually about ethnic Croats in places like Tuzla or Sarajevo or even in the RS entity of which there are several thousand um, because they don't tend to vote for the HDZ. So their Croat identity is actually not um, real according to the HDZ, right? They're not real Croats because they don't vote for the HDZ. Um, so that is the very, very odd situation um, that we find ourselves right now with international engagement. Um, namely that uh, I believe my wife is going to attempt to rescue the baby for me. So she's gonna make an appearance behind me. <laughs> so the, um, the, the, the curious moment that we find ourselves in right now is that the EU and the US have taken the entirety of their kind of substantive political and diplomatic involvement in this whole situation and attempted to accommodate above all Mr. Chovic, but also in practice, Mr. Dodik. And the reason why I say that, and this is sort of where I wanna end is we actually know very, very little which is hugely problematic. We know very, very little about formally what EU and US negotiators at this moment have proposed and broached with the Bosnian political parties in terms of their kind of overall conception of reform in Bosnia-Herzegovina. All we know is what has been leaked to the media. And everything that has been leaked to the media has been various forms of what to my mind can only realistically be called appeasement, which is to say they are various kinds of legalistic formulations for accommodating the demands of Mr. Chovic, uh, in his case, primarily with what Mr. Palmer proposed, apparently, which is the so-called FULA formula, um, which is an extremely complicated method for electing um, the Bosnian presidency, which can be summed up as in the case of the federation entity where two uh, members of the presidency are elected, this would be a system where the first post would go to whoever won the most votes, that's fairly clear, but then the second post would go to the person who won the most votes in the five cantons where the first place won the least votes. Uh, that would in practice mean that you would elect 
uh, overall, when you're looking at the overall kind of vote count, you would elect and practice number one and possibly number four and five. Um, why have this extremely complicated gerrymandered system so that the HDZ can be ensured that their candidate will win? Because their candidates only poll, as I said, very, very small votes overall. But if you kind of create a very special category for them to be able to win, they will obviously win, right? So that's what we know Mr. Palmer has proposed, at least officially, as far as um, electoral reform is concerned. And then we also know that Ms. Ayhuast, as well as uh, Mr. Orban's enlargement commissioner, who has also been involved uh, in the margins, they've also been trying to deal with the state property issue. Um, and they have proposed the generous compromise, apparently, that about 90% of state properties in the RS entity would go to the entity, and 10% would go to the state in addition to a very significant reduction in the overall troop numbers in the Bosnian armed forces. Unsurprisingly, unsurprisingly, none of the actual so-called pro-BIH parties or pro-reform parties in Bosnia and Herzegovina who actually constitute the majority of the parliament are going to go ahead and vote for any of this. And so at this hour, um, these talks, uh, not just the election, but the kind of broader reform talks appear very, very much on the verge of dying and being over. Um, I think there's been profound disillusionment in particular with the US and the uh, EU. Um, and as a result, we can likely expect that all of this stuff that I've been talking to you about today, this entire crisis is likely going to escalate and get worse in the next two to six weeks once Mr. Chovich and Dodik realize that um, their hopes and wishes have, have, have failed and, and they don't have partners uh, for this kind of grand bargain uh, about Bosnia's internal uh, administration and division. Okay, I think I've talked enough. Uh, I will stop there and uh, open up to Q&A. Jasmine, thank you very much indeed. And um, we should also thank your co-presenter who uh, was remarkably efficient, I thought, all the way through in uh, the contribution that she made. Um, you've given us a lot to think about. I know that some questions have come in. Um, again, to the audience that is joining us from around the world, if you want to ask a question, you've just got to go to Q&A function, and I can then relay that question to Jasmine. I want to, if I can begin, uh, Jasmine, um, by saying that um, there is a sensibility in Ireland about conflict, which means that the kind of issues that you're talking about may be more readily understood here than in other jurisdictions. You are right, of course, that the scale of killing in the Balkans and especially in Bosnia was vastly more significant and it also in a compressed time frame relative to 30 years where we lost almost 4,000 people. But the issue that you raised, which is how do these post-agreement complex political architectures be made to work and how do they hold together over time, especially when you have veto players within those systems that in some cases are determined to bring those institutions to the point of collapse. And this is where some people would argue external actors have a particular role. And you mentioned Matthew Palmer, for example, and the United States, the European Union too. If I could just come to the latter first, on the European Union, isn't there a special responsibility here? And isn't the EU in, um, the position where 18 years after promising every state in the region that they would become members of the EU, um, not only have, has that commitment not been fulfilled, the problem of obstruction by EU member states seems worse now than at any time in the past. Um, we do, however, have a new government in Germany, uh, a new foreign minister, and so that first question is about whether you see the possibility of EU policy changing within the near future. Acknowledging, of course, that it has been President Macron that has been a really big problem uh, for the region because he has seemed to be especially opposed 
to any of the states in the Western Balkans even making progress, let alone graduating to become members. Um, but perhaps you might just talk about the member states, their different interests in the region, and whether we will see any breakthrough at EU level in the near future. So that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, I, I, I will just say one thing very quickly, because you kind of talked about this notion of various kinds of commitments that, that have been made over the years, um, both by the EU and, and obviously the US as well as the as the actual architect of the Dayton Agreement. So having a almost dare one say a kind of legal obligation to the Bosnian state. Um, I, I, I have to confess, I think I'm very much someone who has kind of been mugged by reality um, in the sense that um, not just my own personal experiences with, with the Bosnian war and being a refugee and all of that, um, but I think I, I have a view of, in particular, the last decade or so of, of European and, and international history um, as really very categorically having changed the nature of what we might have called kind of the post-Cold War liberal consensus. It's very hard for me to look at um, what's happened in Syria or Ukraine, um, or dare one even say Afghanistan, although it's a very different situation, um, and be particularly optimistic about what one may or may not expect from the EU or the US vis-a-vis -vis Bosnia, even in a kind of catastrophic scenario. Um, that having been said, I think as far as the EU is concerned, um, as you know, the, the real issue is that, um, Again, we are we are now well past the stage of pretending. It's 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 very clear that the mood has turned against enlargement um, within the bloc writ large. I mean, that's there's there's exceptions, right? There's countries that still kind of are holding the line, <clears throat> but obviously France is not among them. Um, it's also very clear that um, countries like Hungary, Poland, Slovenia, and even to some extent Croatia have begun a to erode uh, the, the, the democratic legitimacy of the EU writ large. I mean, as someone, as an MEP in Brussels actually a couple of days ago told me, you know, we were beginning to recognize that there are now elements of state capture within the EU itself, thanks to, you know, Orban and, and, and all the rest of them. And so in that sense, I'm, you know, uh, uh, when I look at the EU and I think of the EU, for instance, as the commission, um, I expect very, very little. Um, in particular, when I see people like uh, Ms. Angelina Eichhorst, uh, who those of you who have been following me on Twitter have been going into much more detail about what she's been doing in Bosnia, but I'll just say for now that it's extremely problematic. Um, I, I, the thing that I'm cautiously optimistic about is that we are finally seeing a change of conversation in individual member states, um, Germany, the Netherlands, um, a handful of other countries who have explicitly come out and said, not only do they support sanctions, but they're willing to themselves think about essentially imposing unilateral sanctions. And here I have to say, I'm very optimistic, just in the sense that I was one of the people who very personally, you know, talked to a lot of decision makers in, in various European capitals. And I can tell you, it was not two or three years ago, sitting in Berlin, where I made this argument to the then members of the then German government saying, you can do this legally, you can, you can unilaterally impose um, sanctions if you have the political will. Um, and at that time, I received a very, very curt and cold response to that suggestion, and also was told that I was not correct. I, I had misrepresented the law. Um, well, it turns out I had not misrepresented the law. But, you know, politics moves by its own pace, as it were. So, so that gives me a certain kind of optimism. And it also gives me optimism what we've seen from the European Parliament. I think it is important that we now have a number of MEPs who have spoken very clearly about the situation in Bosnia, the situation in the region, are actually asking and demanding that the EU commit itself to credible democratization processes, even beyond the question of enlargement. Right. I, the, I, to me, those are two separate issues. Whether or not these countries get into the EU, to me, is less important than the question of is the EU actually going to be a constructive element in promoting democratization in the Western Balkans. That's what I care about. Whether we join the club, as it were, I don't know. And I'll, ultimately, I, it's not that I don't care, but I, it's just not a priority. I, I'm, I'm pro-EU enlargement, but I just don't think it's a relevant question at this hour. Um, so, so that's what I would say there. And, but isn't one of the problems, if I want to just play devil's advocate for a moment and 
take myself off to The Hague or Paris or somewhere else. Um, viewed from those capitals, isn't this a problem that the very people that the European Union is asking to implement EU reforms in Serbia, Montenegro and elsewhere, uh, are the very people who would actually lose most from those reforms. I'm thinking of the circle around President Vucic, around Milo Djukanovic in Montenegro and around Dodik. To some degree, they've all had a very good time with and have benefited from EU regimes of different kinds over the last 10 years. Um, but is a part of the problem that until these, in some cases, kleptocratic authoritarians are not kicked out of office, we don't have the kind of partners in these capitals that we need to actually change the dial on the relationship. Absolutely. Right. So there's there's no getting around the issue that from the perspective of, hey, where are the kind of good, positive Democrats in the Western Balkans? We don't have a whole lot to choose from. Right. Um, however, I think the, the, the answer to that is also a little bit more complicated. One, we have to acknowledge that there's been almost three decades uh, of European buttressing, above all financial buttressing of these recalcitrant, illiberal and authoritarian tendencies, right? I mean, I've had the conversation over the last few weeks with a number of policymakers in a number of capitals about the idea of sanctions vis-a-vis um, -vis the ERS, which I'm for, or rather the RS regime. And again, which I'm for, but I also emphasize to them, you have to acknowledge that they have tremendous financial reserves, almost all of which have come from you. Right. So I believe that we should impose sanctions today rather than tomorrow so that we can more quickly deplete those reserves. But I'm not under the impression that even imposing those sanctions will sort of suddenly magically immediately change things. So we have to acknowledge that policy regimes leave legacies and the EU's kind of um, promotion of, you know, what, as you know, in the academic literature is kind of pejoratively referred to as stableocracy. Um, this has left a tremendous, tremendous residual power in the worst quarters, essentially. And I have to also add, then we have the example of North Macedonia, where you had a government make tremendous sacrifices, tremendous sacrifices. They changed the name of their country believing that they were going to get not a free ride, but that they were going to be given a very credible horizon um, for EU negotiations and, and to get along that path. And true, North Macedonia did accede to NATO. Great, that was, that, was, that was a very, very important part of the picture. But when it came to the EU, our friends in Paris and a handful of other uh, uh, North European capitals pulled the rug out from Mr. Zayev, who you can make of him whatever you will. Uh, and there's all kinds of criticisms of Zayev that we could make and, you know, how much of a true Democrat is he and da 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 But he walked the walk and he talked the talk. He delivered. The EU did not. And his government fell. And so now we're, you know, it's just a matter of time, I think, before the Vimero uh, de Pemene is back in power. It's very likely a question of hours at that point uh, when Nikola Gruevsky returns from his uh, uh, exile in Budapest. I mean, this ultimately falls squarely on the on the feet of the the European Union. So yeah, obviously the uh, there is there is no uh, great abundance of Democrats um, in the region, but they exist in every single country, and we have not done a tremendously good job of giving them a hand up. Is what I would say. I'm going to turn to questions now from our audience, Jasmine. There are quite a few of them. Sure, yeah. Off the sign that you have um, been very thought-provoking. Our colleague, Dr. Brendan Flynn from the National University of mm -hmm. Ireland, Galway. Two questions. Which part is Russian support for mm -hmm. playing behind the secession movement? Is it significant or is it just noise? Right. And secondly, what can the West and the European Union do if Republika Srpska were to illegally succeed? I guess that question also involves Vucic. Where sure. does Vucic stand yeah. on this and what's the relationship between Belgrade and Banja Luka? 
So a couple of things. One, it's very important to understand that all of this that Mr. Dudek is doing, he would not be doing unless he understood and believed that he enjoyed very significant support, both from Belgrade and Moscow, right? He is, he's, he's not an idiot. He's not irrational. He's a lot of things, but he's not a fool. Um, and so he understands that he can rely on a very high degree of diplomatic, political, and also very alarmingly, I think, he genuinely believes that he will enjoy material support from both Serbia and Russia in the event of a catastrophic scenario. What people often get confused about is that, um, you know, they'll often say, well, you know, Vucic wouldn't want a real crisis in Bosnia, Putin wouldn't want a real crisis. And it, that's actually not true. They are not opposed to a real security crisis in Bosnia. What they're concerned about is that, be a, that it be a real security crisis over which they have control. If they believe they have control and they can get a real security crisis, they will go down that road. The only times that we have ever seen any kind of daylight between Vucic and Dodik and Dodik and, and, and Putin is when either Belgrade or the Kremlin have felt that he has moved too fast for what they want to do. There's never been any sense that they're opposed to the actual ideological end game. What they're opposed to is certain kind of sequencing. It is also important to acknowledge, and this is something very, um, to my mind, very alarming, Mr. Dodik does have a distinct relationship with the Kremlin from Mr. Vucic. So he has his own direct line to the Kremlin. He also has his own direct line to some of the paracriminal elements around the Kremlin, which have been deployed in places like Ukraine above all, but also other um, uh, uh, places, Montenegro, Serbia, uh, which of course has a very significant um, Russian intelligence presence, uh, uh, even Syria. So, you know, it is it is the kind of little green men Wagner group model that we really have to be concerned about in terms of concrete material support um, in the in the case of any kind of real security situation in Bosnia and Herzegovina, rather than some kind of massive Russian armada. Right. In terms of what can practically be done, um, I, I, I've been at pains to emphasize that it is not sufficient for Western governments to say that they support the sovereignty and territorial integrity of the Bosnian state. Um, we say the same thing about in Ukraine and a whole hell of a lot of good it's done them. Um, one has to add, we support the territorial integrity and sovereignty of the Bosnian state and the efforts of Bosnian government forces to protect the same. And in that sense, um, I, you know, I, I do believe that if we are very serious about preventing secession, one of the most practical things that can be done is to buttress U4. Um, I would actually like to see U4 buttress through a proper NATO mandate to see actual an, the return of an actual NATO contingent. There is already a NATO HQ and a small number of troops. Focusing specifically on the Butchko corridor in northeastern Bosnia, the reason why that's important is because I remind you that the western half of the RS, where Banja Luka is located, and and the entire political and security apparatus of the entity is essentially located, it does not share a border with Serbia. It does not share a physical border with Serbia. That's why Butchko exists as a corridor to to separate it. Uh, that entire eastern half of the entity is, for all intents and purposes, empty. That's not a joke. It's just it's very, very sparsely populated. It's a large territory, but with very, very few people. So the, the real secession threat essentially is not from that eastern wing of the RS, it's from the western one. If you if you have an international presence in Butchko, that's pretty much the end of that story. Um, and then obviously, I mean, I, 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 I would like to see much deeper security cooperation between NATO governments and uh, the Bosnian Armed Forces as well as other security services in Bosnia and Herzegovina and more transparent commitments to, to shoring up the sovereignty and territorial integrity of Bosnia and Herzegovina. But, you know, I'll leave it at that for now. I have um, two questions that broadly ask the same thing. One from Matthias Godeking and one mm -hmm. from Odia Baron. Uh, Matthias says, thank you so much for the concise introduction to this very complicated uh, issue. What do scenarios for the escalation that you talked about look like? And I know that in some instances you have been criticized because um, you argue that the threat of escalation is real and it's mm -hmm. imminent. Other people uh, suggest that, that that's not in fact so, that there's a calculus at work in Banja Luka and elsewhere yeah. and that that kind of escalation is not going to happen. So maybe you could just sort of chart out for us briefly 
what that escalatory path might look like. So I think the, the most obvious target for escalation uh, is going to be the 2022 elections. Uh, Mr. Dodik and Mr. Chovich are going to attempt to scuttle the elections. They're going to attempt to prevent them from taking place. Uh, Mr. Chovich has very explicitly been dropping hints about that over the last few weeks. Um, it's what he refers to as the so-called Mostadization of Bosnia-Herzegovina. What he's referencing to is the fact that the city of Mostad basically spent a decade without democratic elections uh, as a result of this kind of impasse between the HDZ and the SDA. Um, this would accomplish a number of things uh, for both the HDZ and, and the SNSD, um, outside of basically locking them into power in the current arrangement. Um, it would also further their shared ambition of, of demonstrating that Bosnia is essentially a failed state and a completely dysfunctional state and would then raise appetites in the international community for radical solutions in Bosnia and radical solutions they bet uh, would essentially be various kinds of partitions, either a kind of formal of the state in its entirety or uh, at least uh, internally. Again, I go back to the third entity thing. Um, separately from that, Mr. Dudek is also very clearly going to escalate um, further with threats of secession. He's, I think, going to direct clear and clear attacks on the armed forces. Over the weekend, they had this very significant session in which they said that they were going to pass a number of laws concerning the armed forces, the intelligence agency, and the tax authority within that the next six months. So again, if you think about the timeline, six months pushes them basically just essentially to the eve of the next general elections, which should be in October 2022. Um, so, uh, you know, the, the blueprint is there. Um, and what both Chovich and Dodik are ultimately waiting for and waiting to see is whether they are going to suffer any kind of real consequences for anything that they're doing at this point. Um, if they don't, they're going to keep escalating because their logic and the methodology they've perfected over the last few years, or not last few years, better nearly two decades, is um, you just keep raising the temperature, keep raising the temperature, keep raising the temperature, and then the international community at some point comes along and says, okay, we need to all calm down, but you never go back to point zero, you go back to you know, where you were 75%, uh, 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 you, know, you advance your point 75% of the line and, and, and there you go, right? So they kind of keep moving the goalposts as it were. And this is ultimately what, what, what frightens me because even if this particular crisis in some shape or form is resolved, um, unless it's resolved in a, such a way where Mr. Dodek and Chovic actually suffer consequences for what they've done, they're just going to concoct another crisis or another series of crises. Um, and it's the kind of, you know, death by a thousand paper cuts, which is essentially what, what, what Bosnia has been experiencing for the better part of the last 20 years or so. Uh, another question from Peter Vlirhaus. Um, Peter's question is about the role of Croatia's HDZ, the ruling uh, party. Um, what role does it play formally or informally in respect of its relationship with uh, HDZ in Bosnia. Um, and perhaps the European Union might exercise leverage over them as, um, uh, of course, Croatia is a member of the European Union. I might add to that the question about Croatia's president, Milanovic. Right. His recent comments about genocide, which were really poorly received in many parts of not just the Balkans, but um, elsewhere. Um, he seems to be another actor that is making life difficult for those who would like to move forward in the region. Um, so perhaps you could just speak to those. Sure. Um, so the first thing to be said is that, and this is not a joke, people, people laugh when I say this, but it, and this is to me very sad, actually. Um, the contemporary creation state has no foreign policy beyond Bosnia-Herzegovina, and in particular, Bosnia-Herzegovina's electoral law. That is just a factual statement. The other major foreign policy issue that Croatia had was the issue of um, visa liberalization with the United States, which they got as of a couple of weeks ago. And so at this point now, Croatia has one exclusive foreign policy concern, and that is Bosnia-Herzegovina's electoral law, 
perhaps also the question of migration along the Bosnia Croatia border, um, where the Croatian police have just been kind of running roughshod over, over migrants. Um, and the EU and various human rights organizations have said, you know, there's terrible things happening, brutalization, torture, et cetera, et cetera. They suffer no consequences for it whatsoever. So that also gets to the kind of EU aspect of this. Um, the EU has, I don't think, any real political will or interest in, in dealing with Croatia for the same reason that it struggled to deal with Hungary and Poland. Um, you know, if you can't deal with a country like Hungary or Poland, you're certainly not going to be able to deal with Croatia, or you can turn it around. I mean, both kind of make sense in their own perverse way. Um, that's that's actually, despite the fact that I can tell you this from personal experience, I think within the EU apparatus in Brussels, um, there's tremendous frustration with with the HDZ and the Croatian delegations. Because again, they're, they're, they're kind of exclusively focused on one thing, Bosnia, 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 Bosnia. And it's, it's suffocating uh, because as soon as they kind of take the podium, nearly whatever party they're from, um, even formerly relatively progressive people like uh, Pizzula, for instance, uh, the MEP, uh, on, on Bosnia, he's moved sharply to the right. And so it's a very uncomfortable situation as far as that is concerned. Um, there's also the fact that, um, you have the very particular relationship between the HDZ in Croatia and the HDZ in Bosnia-Herzegovina. The HDZ in Bosnia-Herzegovina is considerably to the right of the HDZ in Croatia, um, but the HDZ in Croatia relies on the voters that the HDZ BIH can deliver to them. Not actually even so much from Bosnia proper, but the very large, um, essentially, diaspora of Bosnian Croats who live in Croatia um, and tend to be much more conservative and right voting um, than, than um, shall we say, native born Croatians. Um, so th there's a very kind of curious parasitic relationship that exists between the two parties. And there has been times where I think even the HDZ in Croatia has been a little bit frustrated with the HDZ in Bosnia, but you know, not to the point where it would have any kind of real political consequence. In terms of Milanovic, um, Milanovic is a symptom of I think a broader malaise in Croatian politics today, which is that again, it's a system that is skewing towards polarization in particular to the right. Um, and Mr. Milanovic's electoral strategy essentially comes down to trying to out, out right wing and out nationalist the HDZ. Um, so he's essentially taken the model of somebody like Miroslav Škoro, the far right singer turned politician. Um, and he's basically said, well, I can do that, but better. Um, and so there's, at this point, no meaningful difference between, for instance, Miroslav Škoro and um, uh, Zoran Milanovic, because he's just, I mean, he's completely out to lunch, as it were. I mean, his, his views on, on Bosnia, his views on Dodik uh, are very, very hard line at this point. Another question from Damir Masic. Damir asks, why is it not a political um, option, a legitimate option for the Republika Srpska entity to pursue greater political independence using peaceful political and democratic means. If they have this aspiration uh, to something else, why mm -hmm. can't they fight for it within the conventions uh, and the parameters set down by Dayton? He compares the situation to Northern Ireland, sure. where nationalists uh, mm -hmm. argue for a united Ireland however that might come about, and in right. Catalonia. So to that point about legitimacy and action. Uh, so it's a very good question. Um, so there's two answers that I would get. One, um, Bosnia is already just objectively speaking the most decentralized state in the world. Um, and so uh, I have another companion again here. Uh, so uh, it's, it's questionable as to what, what more you could ask for while still having any kind of semblance of a, uh, a Bosnian state, right? So that's that's number one. Then the second part is that uh, the way the question is framed, I think is completely correct and legitimate. There is no issue with working within democratic means and institutions uh, to, to whatever demand a party or, or a bloc may have. That's completely legitimate. The issue is that Mr. Dodik and Mr. Chovic are not working within democratic means, right? That's the problem, that they are using um, extra institutional and extra constitutional means to accomplish what they're doing. So in the case of Mr. Dudek, he's threatening secession and he's going outside of, as I explained, the established constitutional purview of not going through the state parliament, but trying to argue that the entity parliament or rather the entity assembly can overrule the state parliament. That doesn't exist anywhere 
Earth, and again, that's de facto secession. And in the case of Mr. Chovich, this is now at least the second major episode. The other, the first one was after 2010, in which he has shut down large segments of completely normal democratic government formation processes because his party didn't get what they want. So that's the thing. If you want to have a conversation about political, territorial, whatever, reorganization of Bosnia, cool, let's have that. But let's have it within standard political democratic institutional frameworks. Both Mr. Chovic and Dodik are going outside of that and then accusing others of saying, you know, imposing their will on them or, you know, then complaining about the demand for sanctions. And da, 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 da. So you can't have it both ways, right? You, you can either work within institutions and then we can have robust political disagreements, which is part of the democratic process, or you can go outside of the political system, which is what they're both doing. And then one has to entertain extra political and extra constitutional solutions to that. Um, could I ask, um... Jasmine, about the economy in Bosnia and socioeconomic issues. Um, the whole region has experienced this extraordinary outmigration over the last decade, where um, huge numbers of people have left the Balkans for other parts of Europe and elsewhere. Um, Bosnia, like other states, has suffered disproportionately in respect of illness and death from COVID on top of the floods in previous years and uh, other things. Um, how much do you think that has fed into this sense of stasis? Um, and what would it take to bring people back, Bosnians back to their own country, for example? What kind of incentives might they need to turn those sort of patterns around? Uh, so, I mean, the, the, the setup of the question is exactly right. I mean, this is a country that has experienced tremendous social and economic hardship. I, I, ultimately, I think um, what would be necessary to, to sort of see very significant socioeconomic turnaround, in particular from the perspective of the diaspora, um, in which I am a part, um, and, and also have a very kind of particular relationship with Bosnia, um, I, I, I think the, the scale of emigration uh, has, has fundamentally been animated by the perception that nothing has changed in Bosnia and it's only getting worse. And so to turn that around really just fundamentally requires convincing people that there are consequences for bad behavior. The, 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 the categorical and structural problem in Bosnia is that it seems like it's a country where you can literally do anything. It's, it's, it's a consequence-free zone. Uh, you know, you can threaten secession, you can obstruct government formation, you can steal, lie, and cheat, uh, at, you know, till the cows come home and no one is going to pick you off. Neither the local institutions, which are captured by many of these same malign actors, and neither is the international community though. And that's, I think, really the part that sort of sticks in people's crawl. I think that's the thing that has sent people over the edge. That's actually why you're seeing today a, a white collar, well-to-do middle-class people leaving Bosnia, people who have good jobs, whose kids are going to private schools, who, you know, who actually have a very, very comfortable life in Bosnia they're leaving. And it's because they simply no longer believe that anyone is on their side. And, and, and you know, worst case scenario, um, they, they, don't, they don't trust that their children's future is, is secure anymore. And that, I think, is, um, is, is sort of the, the great tragedy of contemporary Bosnia, that it's, if you want to sort of talk about the, the wholesale collapse of the kind of proverbial legitimacy of the political West. You can see it essentially, you know, in, in a single place in the country of Bosnia Herzegovina, which once upon a time was the poster child of liberal internationalism. Today, it's a place where that same, I say sadly, liberal international project has lost virtually all legitimacy. One of the arguments that is made about Northern Ireland, Jasmine, is that the Good Friday Agreement inadvertently empowered the extremes. It actually drove people 
into the arms of Sinn Féin when it used to be the minority political party in the national side, it became the majority. And on the unionist side, the Democratic Unionist Party rejected the Good Friday Agreement and then it became the majority party. The same argument could, could it not could be made in Bosnia that the ethno-nationalist hold of particular parties actually increased as a result of Dayton. So does the problem actually lie in the mechanics of Dayton? And does that mean that if we were to go back and adjust and fix them, that at least some of this problem might be solved? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I agree with that absolutely. Um, Dayton is a, is a framework that was never designed to exist for a quarter century. Um, it was designed to provide warring factions with immediate security guarantees. And then the idea was that once you had a relatively stable and secure environment, you could begin the process of political liberalization, which is actually what was attempted during uh, uh, the 2000s. There were several rounds of attempted constitutional reform. Um, those failed. And today you have a situation where hardline nationalist actors, in particular the HDZ and the SNSD, um, have created a situation where they have also convinced the international community that in a sense Dayton is the ceiling rather than the floor, right? Uh, uh, rather than this is the point from which we're now going to move up and create more robust democratic institutions that will provide greater transparency, greater competition, greater accountability. No, Dayton is the ceiling. And you can see that again very clearly in the HDZ's electoral demands. Any model that moves Bosnia towards essentially the Aki, if you kind of want to distill it, towards an actual European standard of parliamentary democracy is rejected out of hand. Because the only thing that the HDZ is willing to sign off on are various kinds of sectarian gerrymandering mechanisms, which will essentially perpetually create a system that will essentially, and this is the great kind of perversion and irony, will create an electoral system where elections are meaningless. Because if you know that no matter how you vote, the HDZ, for instance, gets a third of all ministerial seats, why vote? Why vote? Because the elections at that point are completely theatrical. And that ironically is exactly what they want. Because again, it's a party with 9% of the vote. They know they can't compete, but they, as a result of the date and arrangements, like I said, they end up with 30 or 40% of the seats. So uh, you're absolutely right. There is a, there is a perverse sectarian logic to the Dayton constitution that has essentially prevented and, and, and frozen Bosnia uh, in, in where it is. And of course, now that, that frozen status is actually yeah. beginning to metastasize, right? It's like having a boil that you never, you know, you never deal with the abscess. It just gets worse and worse and infected. And, and in a sense that sectarian logic is now infected. There was a lot of controversy, you may recall a couple of years ago when the leaders of Serbia and Kosovo emerged from talks with this plan to essentially swap territory, where part of the Preshevo Valley would be swapped with the area in Kosovo north of the Ibar River. And uh, although it didn't happen, and although there was a lot of opposition to it expressed in the region and internationally, um, I, one gets the feeling that in the State Department, in Washington, in Brussels as well, there are lots of people who think that this might be a sort of neat solution to the problem in the region. And of course, that has major implications for Bosnia. Um, how likely do you think uh, that the idea of land swaps might come back onto the agenda in the near future, particularly if we get to the point where escalation leads to violence in any of these jurisdictions? I think, unfortunately, the, the, the possibility of that as a policy option against re-emerging um, is quite likely, um, because that is historically the international community's preferred model for dealing with these kinds of conflicts, even though it doesn't work. <laughs> That's, but it's, it's, it's sort of stupidly simple, which is, I think, why it's popular, um, because it's the kind of thing where, uh, you know, 
uh, the baby is trying to break out of the office. Uh, it's the kind of thing where, and, and I really don't mean this in a pejorative sense, I think there's a very neat bureaucratic logic here. Think about working in a foreign ministry and you're used to working on Malawi. And then suddenly somebody comes along and says, uh, look at Susan, we got to move you up to Bosnia. And now Bosnia is on fire and you got to come up with a concrete policy solution. What is the simplest thing to say? Cut it in half. Yeah. Cut it in three ways. Cut it in however many directions you need to deliver some kind of uh, uh, actionable solution. Oh and this is why this has generally been the preferred kind of model for what seemed like, quote unquote, intractable sectarian conflicts. They're actually not intractable sectarian conflicts. It's just that unfortunately, most of the time, the international community doesn't have the diplomatic attention or energy to deal with them. Right. And so you say, well, just cut it in half. Northern Ireland, Cyprus, Bosnia, Kosovo, uh, uh, Lebanon, Iraq, um, Pakistan, India, on down the list we go, both actual and attempted partition schemes. Um, it's it's just, uh, you know, it's it, to me, it's always it's a kind of failure of not just political imagination, but basic rationality. Um, because in the, specifically in the context of the Balkans and Bosnia in particular, there's no way that you could enact partition without kicking off another round of violence, right? I mean, this is, the, you know, the, 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 in, in the literature on the war, this is very, very clearly the case, where in some, in many instances, once international plans for various forms of internal partition of Bosnia became known, to actors on the ground, they would then begin to target those municipalities that were supposed to go one way or another in an attempt to you know, make partition more palatable or more easier, which is, uh, you know, uh, Josip Glowitvich, the great um, uh, uh, Croatian American historian, uh, calls this blueprints for ethnic cleansing. That, that's essentially what I think of all kind of partition schemes. They're blueprints for ethnic cleansing because before you can actually enact them, First, we have to get rid of a whole bunch of people who are inconvenient to the lines that we're attempting to draw. Yeah. Um, a, a question from Alex Krukshanks, um, which is about Croatia again. How much could the recent ongoing rise in opinion polls, in other words, of Mozemo, change policy towards Bosnia Herzegovina? Were they to gain more traction in Bosnia or in Croatia? Uh, I, I think it's a good question. I mean, the the the, the silver lining with Croatian politics in, in Croatia proper has always been that there has a very strong um, wing of the Croatian political spectrum across different political parties that has been very good on Bosnia, right? These are people like uh, Vesna Pusic, uh, Stipe Mesic, uh, 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 historically, actually, the Social Democratic Party, uh, now with the exception of Mr. Milanovic, and some of the more recent changes that have taken place in that party. Um, but historically, there has always been a, a, a very um, good kind of, I don't want to say pro-Bosnian wing, but but essentially a, a wing of Croatian politics that has had a very correct attitude towards Bosnia and Herzegovina, and also very importantly, uh, was uh, uh, willing to speak truthfully about what Tudjman had done in Bosnia, and uh, that he had effectively sponsored the invasion of Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, 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 during the 90s, and, and worked very closely with Milosevic in the attempted partition uh, of Bosnia. So to my mind, uh, Mojimo, um, you know, emerging as a major political factor in Croatian politics is very, very good. We've already seen a number of their uh, political representatives um, speak very powerfully, not just about Bosnia, but I think about sort of the broader malaise of nationalist politics in Croatia. I think the rise of that kind of progressive option in Croatia is good for Croatian democracy, first and foremost, and I think it will then ultimately have um, positive outcomes for, for Bosnia as well in the event that they should, you know, successfully take power. Yeah, um, thanks very much uh, indeed, uh, Jasmine. Um, uh, we've more or less come to the end of the period that we've uh, had with you. I want to thank you very much indeed for such a comprehensive and illuminating talk. Um, so many issues packed in there and so many of us who may not be experts on Bosnian politics, but recognize the contours at least of the range of problems that are there. 
I want to thank our uh, contributors and to apologize to those whose questions that um, I didn't get to. And there was one in particular by uh, Mirza Katabusic that I uh, wanted to raise, but in, in, in answering the questions, uh, you've done exactly that. Uh, at the outset of the hour, it was a bit like the Eurovision Song Contest. I wondered what it would be like with two presenters, but actually it worked out much better than most Eurovision Song Contests do, I thought. So thank We you. got the points. We got the points. Got the po yes, deux pas all around, I would say. So thanks very much indeed. I will say again to those who are following us that we are going to issue a call for papers shortly on a conference that will look at the aftermath of the Dayton Agreement in Bosnia and the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. And we'll try and bring two groups of experts together, uh, hopefully in Ireland in June, if the COVID situation permits. And so anybody who may be interested in that, please do follow us and uh, we hope to engage with you. So with that, I just want to say thank you very much indeed again to Jasmine Thank you very much indeed to all our participants, everybody who asked questions and everybody who has joined us from around the world. Until next time, conscious that this is our event, our last event of the year. Thanks to everybody who has played a part in making those events a success, especially Anne Hamilton Black and our colleagues at the Maynooth University Social Science Institute. Thank you, Anne, and thanks indeed to everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much.